Welcome to Historically Speaking. My name is Jayawardhan Singh and today we are going to talk about how historians have tried to view the Kushan state. But before we talk about the Kushan state, I think it is important to first have a basic understanding of the Kushan history. So first we have to understand that Kushan uh, the uh, the, pe- the Kushan people were nomadic pastoral people and because of this some scholars believe that th- there is this uh, you know uh, 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 hindrance in, in to understand the culture and the history of kushanas because they uh, the kind of literature which we have about the kushan is very little for example there is no official biography or official history and uh, whatever we know of the kushan history comes from two three inscriptions and uh, mostly through their coins and when we talk about the sources we are going to talk about it it is particularly the early history of the kushan empire it is the chinese sources that provide us a lot of information so in the chinese sources or from the chinese sources we learn that kushanas belonged to a tribe which were called yuchis or uh, i i i know i'm pronouncing this uh, this wrong wrongly so Uh, they were called yuchis and they inhabited the region of if you today look at the map of china and mongolia and the border region of both of these countries so this was the region uh, ganzu province is the you know main center of the uh, early yuchi where uh, they had their original homelands now one important point about the about the yuchis is that most scholars are of the opinion that yuchis were not uh, were not chinese okay so they were indo they were people who spoke an indo iranian language so that is important for us to remember so what we see is that around the 2nd uh, century bc these yuchis were forced to migrate to to the east so this was because uh, a particular tribe had you know attacked them so eventually what we see is that by 130 bc these yuchis have uh, uh, were now settled in the region of northern bactria bactria is the bulk region which is uh, if you look at today's map you can see north of hindu kush mountains so northern bactria region these yuchis have now uh, you know settled and what we see is that uh, around the mid fifth uh, uh, mid 1st century bc so around 50 bc e we see that uh, these yuchi uh, this single tribe of yuchi is now divided into five different principalities or kingdoms now the reason why this division took place we are not sure why this happened most scholars believe that it was either because what there was a, a ruler who earlier controlled the single tribe but after his death there was uh, there was some weak suc- successor or no successor and that is how uh, these uh, these five principalities of the yuchis were now split so so this uh, this is sp- uh, this split continued for around a century and around 50 ce so most of this story which uh, which uh, the history which i am going to uh, i am telling you comes from the chinese sources so it is entirely from the chinese sources we know about this so uh, this ch- these chinese sources tell us that uh, around 50 ad what happens is that the the five different uh, principalities or kingdom of the yuchis were again reunited and the person who reunites these yuchis is called kajula kadfaises this is the name which is provided in the uh, chinese sources so kajula kadfaises has now united the five yuchis and kajula kadfaises comes from a family which in chinese sources is called kue shang and uh, now the reason why this reunification of the yuchi tribes happened is a matter of debate but what we see is that if we look at the so this uh, so uh, just to be clear that na- the yuchis in during this period is uh, are occupying the region of bactria and uh, some parts of uh, hindu kush mountain so and also you know uh, uh, south of in hindu kush mountain as well 
so this is the whole region which is is now being inhabited by the uh, by these five different uh, principalities of the uchis and uh, this reunification happened according to some scholars because when we look at uh, the south of the uchi territory we see that gondo ferris gondo ferris was was a, a was an indo parthian king and uh, during this period what he had done is he had conquered the kabul and swat valley so because of this threat of gondo ferris that he might invade the uh, uchi territory this threat of gondo ferris's invasion forced the uchis to uh, to become reunited again but now the name was no, no longer uchi they called themselves kushan or kweshang and uh, uh, this was because the ruler who has uh, who had un united them was from the family of the kweshang now uh, how can we say that now uh, uh, there are some evidence which suggest that uh, kajula catfice is the f first kushan ruler who had you know reunited these five different tribes of the uchis uh, he most likely uh, was uh, was you know uh, under the authority of the indo-parthian king gondo ferris we can say this because uh, there is this uh, buddhist monastery near mardan mardan is the is a city in northwestern province uh, or which is now called khaibar pakhtun khwa of pakistan so near mardan there is this monastery called takte bahi and in takte bahi there is this inscription which tells us that which uh, uh, which is dates which dates to around 45 ad so this is the same period you know when uh, the kajula, kajula cat phises has had reunited the kushan territories or uh, sorry uh, the different uh, five uchi tribes and gondo ferris is conquering the kabul region so here in this inscription uh, it appears that uh, Kush, uh, the kajula cat phises was under the authority of gondo ferris so that is how some scholars believe that uh, the uh, gondo ferris was able to subdue uh, subdue or, uh, or 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 uh, there was this agreement that he he is now some type of a vessel the kushan king is some type of a vessel so so this is now we have to leave kajula cat phises for a moment and talk about the name kushan itself so as i have uh, said that uh, kushan was uh, kushan was probably a dynastic name of the family of kajula catfices and uh, in their coin we see that uh, for example uh, kanishka's coin now in kanishka's coin we see that in the uh, these, these coins are either in the greek script and or in the kharoshti script there is also some coins which are in prakrit so in the greek script what we, what we see is that what is written is shao nano shao kanishke kushano so we know that you know kushan was their name and uh, the prakrit uh, there is this you know uh, is buddhist stoop in a, in a in a site called manikyala manikyala is near ravelpindi and from here we learn that uh, uh, there is this uh, general of the kushan who has the title of gushan vamsa samvardhak meaning strengthener of the kushan line so here what we see is that ka is replaced with ga so kushan becomes gushan but this is not you know this is quite a special case because in the prakrit uh, prakrit uh, inscriptions or prakrit uh, legend on the kushan coins it is written kushan so uh, that we should keep in mind so basically the kushan themselves called kushan and in chinese we have already uh, uh, seen how they were called kweishang but interestingly what we see is that when we read indian sources or sorry for example indian texts like puranas and there are some reference to in mahabharat and uh, uh, ramayana as well so in the puranas particularly first of all no kushan ruler is mentioned by name so we do not know any any kushan ruler by name and the name kushan itself or gushan uh, whether we are talking both of these name never appears instead we have some names like tushkar tushar 
तुखार तुरुक्ष ना तुरुक्ष इज क्वाइट इंटरेस्टिंग बिकॉज आई थिंक मोस्ट ऑफ अस आर अवेयर दैट तुरुक्ष वॉज ऑल्सो यूज फॉर द टर्क्स एंड द अर्ली मुस्लिम हु इन्वेडेड इन द फ्रॉम एट्थ और टू ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी सो इट इज इंटरेस्टिंग दैट इन द इंडियन सोर्सेज देर इज नो टर्म कॉल्ड कॉल्ड कुशाण वी हैव ओनली तुष्कर तुषार तुखार तुरुक्ष एंड this is uh, and and in the western sources western classical sources greek uh, greek and roman sources we see that here also we are told that the uh, the kingdom of bactria was conquered now i think most of us know that bactria was earlier occupied by the greeks and uh, uh, in the classical accounts we are told that this kingdom of bactria which the greek ruled they were occupied by four or five Uh, nations and of these four or five nation there was a nation called the tochari uh, 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 they did the, this a particular nation belonged to a tribe of tochari and uh, and that is why this you know the, this similarity between tochari and uh, tukhar or tushar is quite interesting and uh, so this is the what we see is that after this pe- uh, this uh, this period onwards the region of oxus river uh, so if you look at the map and uh, see the oxus river so both the banks of oxus and the region of bulk was now called tokharistan so uh, when we read you know the 8th or 9th century arabic sources we are told especially about this region called tokharistan and when huen sang you know travels in this region he also talk uh, talks about the tokharis so it is quite interesting that you know whether we are talking about the classical sources or whether we are talking about the our indian sources there is no mention of the term kushan now uh, sticking to the indian sources what we see is that in the puranas it is explicitly mentioned that 14 tushar kings will succeed the yavanas and uh, in the mats puran earlier it was believed that you know uh, mats puran tells us that tushar kings uh, or these 14 tushar kings will rule together for uh, will rule for a total period of 7000 years now this was uh, you know uh, like uh, many incidents which is you know completely arbitrary the manuscript from which we get this information this matsya puran manuscript here there is a mistake and this mistake is quite interesting and i think we should uh, devote a little time about it so in this manuscript of matsya puran it is written sapt varsh sahasrani meaning uh, 7000 rule but what when we read you know brahmand puran we are told that uh, th- they assign around 105 years for these 14 tushar kings and in vayu puran also this was the this is the same year so 105 years is also present in vayu puran so some scholars believe that the scribe who you know copied this manuscript he made a mistake here so what should be there was what should be there is sapt varsh shatani meaning 105 107 years whereas the shatani part is is you know is is became sahasrani so this is quite interesting you know when how this simple uh, mistake or uh, I, do, i do i don't think we should call it simple mistake but this is small mistake can uh, change the whole uh, meaning of how because earlier when you read you know uh, earlier history books you will find that uh, they will tell us that matsya puran matsya puran tells us that kushan ruled these tushara kings ruled for uh, for 7000 years so this is uh, an interesting you know i think event uh, now whether we are reading uh, whether we are reading the puranas or or even in mahabharat and in some phrases of uh, ramayana whenever they talk about these tusharas or tukharas we see that they had this sense uh, these uh, 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 these texts had this sense that they uh, these people were not indians and they were distinct people who lived who had their own country in the mountains of himalaya 
एंड दिस कंट्री वॉज सिचुएटेड बियॉन्ड द फ्रंटियर ऑफ भारतवर्ष और आर्यवर्त एज एज इन सम टेक्स्ट द पर्टिकुलर इन नॉर्दर्न इंडिया वॉज कॉल्ड सो दिस इज यू नो ब्रॉड ब्रॉड ओवर व्यू ऑफ द सोर्सेज नाउ लेट्स यू नो कम बैक टू क्वजूला कैटफाइसिस सो मोस्ट स्कॉलर्स नाउ अबाउट मोस्ट क्रोनोलॉजीज ऑफ कुशाण किंग्स देर इज नो एग्जैक्ट क्रोनोलॉजी ऑफ मोस्ट कुशाण किंग्स इन इन हिस्ट्री बुक्स यू विल फाइंड दैट सम स्कॉलर्स और डोंट एग्री ऑन द एग्जैक्ट स्कॉलरशिप सो बट आई विल गिव यू ए रफ स्कॉलर रफ क्रोनोलॉजी ऑफ ऑफ एवरी कुशाण किंग्स टू गेट ए यू नो रफ आइडिया ऑफ वेन दे रूल बट वी शुड कीप इन माइंड दैट देर देर इज नो एग्जैक्ट क्रोनोलॉजी वेन इट कम्स टू कुशाण किंग्स सो कजूला कैटफाइसिस रूल्ड अराउंड फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी फाइव ए डी टू एट्टी फाइव ए डी सो दिस इज आई थिंक अगेन अगेन आई एम रिपीटिंग इट इज ए रफ क्रोनोलॉजी नाउ इंटरेस्टिंगली कजूला कैटफाइसिस हैज दिस टाइटल कॉल्ड सच धर्म शिद सॉरी सच धर्म थिद मीनिंग स्टेड फास्ट इन द ट्रू धर्म एंड दिस शोज दैट यू नो फ्रॉम द स्टार्ट देर वॉ देर इज दिस इंडियनाइजेशन ऑफ द कुशाणाज दैट हैड बिगन एंड नो सो अर्लियर वी हैड टॉक्ट अबाउट हाउ यू नो कजूला कैटफाइसिस वॉज सम टाइप ऑफ ए वेसल ऑफ गोंडो फेरीज बट वॉट वी सी इज दैट इन द लेटर पार्ट ऑफ हिज रेन ही वॉज एबल टू कॉन्कर द टेरेटरीज विच वर कॉन्कर्ड बाय ही वॉज एबल टू कॉन्कर द गोंडो फेरिस टेरेटरी सो द टेरेटरी ऑफ काबुल वैली कश्मीर स्वात विच वर अर्लियर कंट्रोल्ड बाय द इंडो पार्थियंस नाउ कजूला कैटफाइसिस वॉज एबल टू कॉन्कर इट and in the chinese sources we are told that kajula catphysis had a long reign and he he died at the age of 80 now after him uh, uh, you know here here you will see how history you know constantly changes if you read early history books particularly history books that were written in 1950s and 1960s you will find that uh, after kajula catphysis the next kushan king is vima catphysis but re- in in 1993 if i am not wrong uh, there is this inscription called rabatak inscription which was discovered in surkh uh, sorry in rabatak and here we are we we get a chronology of kushan kings this inscription was commissioned by kanishk and in this inscription kanishk you know uh, uh, talks about his chronology chronologies of of his uh, uh, his ancestors so here after kajula catphysis we get the name of vima takto so whenever you read a old uh, if you want to know whether this book was written you know before 1993 you can see whether uh, the name vima takto appears or not so this is a one aspect i think which is quite important and rabatak inscription also solved the question of chronology of kanishk because earlier it was believed that uh, the द शक संवत सो शक संवत वॉज द वॉज द वॉज द ईयर वेन कनिष्क बिकेम द नेक्स्ट कुशान रूलर बट इन वेन वी रीड रबातक इंस्क्रिप्शन इट 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 दैट वॉज नॉट द केस कनिष्क बिकेम द कुशान रूलर क्वाइट लेट सो दिस वन पॉइंट विच आई थिंक वी शुड रिमेंबर so after vima takto we have vima catphysis vima catphysis ruled around 100 ad to 126 ad and uh, vima catphysis for indian history is important because it was during his reign that he conquered the north western india so most of pakistan and some portions of uh, present day punjab was conquered by uh, vima takto and finally after vima takto oh, sorry vima catphysis so vima catphysis conquered these regions so after vima catphysis we have his uh, son who is quite famous who, whose name is kanishk so kanishk we are sure that he ruled from 127 ad to 153 ad the last the end of his reign is a matter of debate 
but this is a rough chronology which uh, which i think most scholars find it agreeable so it is during his reign uh, that is in the reign of kanishka we see that the kushan empire has reached its peak so to rough to give you a rough idea of the territory which the kushanas controlled they controlled the region of uh, particularly some parts of uzbekistan tajikistan complete tajikistan turkmenistan parts of xinjiang province of china most of afghanistan complete pakistan large parts of northern and central india and uh, in the eastern india we are pretty sure of the fact that up to varanasi the kushanas had their control after varanasi whether they conquered the region up to patliputra is a matter of debate because in a, in a chinese source we get this this story of how kushan uh, this uh, kanishk uh, was you know uh, had made an expedition to the uh, to the city of patliputra and he was at the gate of the city of patliputra and what he uh, he was going to destroy this city so uh, i'm not going to go this story but uh, there is some scholars believe that you know patliputra was also under the kushan rule whether it was a direct rule or indirect rule we are not sure but what we can uh, assume or what we can you know say is that the region up to varanasi was definitely conquered by the kushanas and in the central india the region around ujjain most scholars are of the opinion that this region was also under the kushan sway so this is a broad you know overview of kushan history now after kushan uh, after kanishk we see that you know kushan empire declines so so this is a broad overview of uh, uh, history of the kushanas now what we see is that <coughs> when we uh, look at the you know how historians have tried to understand this kushan empire and its structure first uh, uh, historians have uh, argued that uh, one of the main evidence of kushan history is kushan coins and kushan coins are found in in great quantity so because these coins are found in great quantity according to rs sharma he believes that this suggests that kushan empire kushan king paid his officials in in cash so the main uh, you know reason why uh, rs sharma thinks so is that if the kushan emperor did not pay these uh, officials in cash he would have to you know give them land grants and by giving them land grants it would mean that uh, the kushan empire was a feudal uh, feudal em feudal society or feudal structure now this would uh, you know disturb the whole paradigm of marxist historians because in, according to the marxist historians it was only during the gupta period that uh, feudalism uh, begins so if if the feudalism feudalism starts in the kushan period it would be it would be quite you know uh, it would uh, wreck the whole marxist historiography but uh, uh, but it is uh, although uh, what basically i'm 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 arguing is that we have no you know exact uh, great evidence to suggest that kushan uh, kushan kings or kushan officials were paid in cash and uh, the fact that you know we have large number of kushan coins does not necessarily mean that we can assume that uh, uh, these officials of the kushan empire were paid in cash so this is what uh, this is my small argument now when it comes to the state structure as i think i have already you know told uh, uh, um, argued in the in the mauryan state talk that uh, whether we are talking about any empire uh, which has a great uh, you know size for example the achaemenids and even the mauryan empire it is quite hard even if, particularly in a po, uh, in a pre industrial society uh, to rule such a vast empire so most of the time a vast empire was not you know rigidly centralized so here also uh, some most scholars are of the opinion that the kushan empire was not rigidly centralized 
and the base of the kushanas was in bactria it is important i think uh, because uh, there is this confusion among certain sections that uh, the kushanas uh, had their base in peshawar or in in mathura but that was not the case for the kushanas their base was always the uh, the region of bactria or bulk because it was their homeland and what we see is that according to r s sharma uh, the kushanas had two capital now here you will see you know this confusion that uh, although the kushanas had their base in uh, bulk or bactria how can they have this capital in peshawar and mathura so this according to sharma suggest that the fact that they had two capitals and base in bactria suggest that the kushanas uh, the, uh, did not have a rigid state uh, re centralized and the, the kushana state was not a centralized entity and for the first time when you know in indian history particularly we said we see that with the accession or with the coming of the kushanas for the first time we get pompous titles so titles like maharaja rajati raja meaning mahara uh, meaning uh, maharaja of uh, lord uh, rajas of rajas so maharaja rajati raja dev putra shau nano shau kushano so this was a single title shau nano shau kushano and uh, another title which i think is is most interesting is kaisar so kaiser i think most of us can uh, can guess kaiser is a version of caesar <laughs> so it is quite interesting you know how kushanas are using different uh, titles so maharaja rajati raja was an indian title shau nano shau kushano uh, shau nano shau kushano was borrowed for, from an iranian title which, which was shahi shahanu shahi which you know later in the 10th or 11th century or even in the present time the title shahanshah is basically uh, is basically you know uh, uh, harks back to this term shahi shahanu shahi so this was the original iranian title and uh, the kushanas had this title of shao shano shao nano shao kushano and the title dev putra some scholars believe that this title you know is similar to the chinese no notion of son of heaven so the fact that you know the kushanas are borrowing from the iranian iranian region iranian cultural heritage from chinese from indian and we have already seen how kaiser is you know a roman term uh, caesar so the so the fact that you know they are borrowing these titles from different uh, different cultural spheres suggest that the kushan empire itself was a multicultural entity and uh, you know uh, another important fact is that some scholars believe that the fact that these uh, rulers used these pompous titles suggest that uh, there might be some junior rulers as well now we don't have any great evidence to suggest that whether you know uh, they had the uh, some junior ruler as well but some scholars have have argued for this now it is interesting when i uh, you know when i said that uh, these uh, these kushanas for the first time employed pompous titles so to you know contrast their titles like dev putra etc we can see the title of uh, ashok because ashok you know had a had a, had a, a similar empire or, a, or or an empire which had more or less the same size that of the kushanas but ashok calls himself raja magadhe so for an a modern emperor who controlled a vast territory he is simply he describing himself as raja magadhe but these rulers are calling themselves dev putra shau nano shau shahi kaiser etc so it is quite interesting now when we look at the kushan state or kushan empire and how it was structured so what we see is that the kushanas uh, had governors or viceroy that were called kshatrap now kshatrap is basically you know they have borrowed this uh, from the iranian or even in the uh, 
This uh, term kshatrap was originally used for Achaemenid governors, and then when we talk about the Indo Greeks or the Bactrian Greeks, they had also borrowed this. But here the term kshatrap had become satraps. So, uh, so what we see is that the Kushanas also had this institution of kshatraps. and uh, the region which was controlled by or the territory which was controlled by a particular kshatrap is called kshatrapi now we are not sure whether uh, you know how many kshatrapis there was in the kushan empire but according to historian b n puri he believes that there are there was around 5 to 7 kshatrapis now four kshatrapis we know that these four kshatrapis existed so the uh, so in mathura there was a kshatrapi sarnath which is in varanasi there was also a kshatrapi surk kotal which is in afghanistan we are sure that there was also a kshatrapi there and in rabatak so these were the four kshatrapis which we are we we are sure that that existed about other kshatrapis we are not sure whether uh, uh, how many of uh, other kshatrapis that existed so what we see is that uh, uh we don't have enough information about how these kshatrapis were governed so it is quite you know um, i think it is quite natural we are not even sure of the fact that how many kshatrapis were there so how can we know uh, you know how these kshatrapis uh, were, how these kshatrapis were governed but from little evidence which we can gather uh, some historians have tried have argued that these kshatrapis were autonomous in nature and uh, one particular evidence uh, to suggest that you know kshatrapis and the kshatraps who governed these kshatrapis were autonomous and had quite had a great extent uh, great great power under their hand can be seen from the kshatrapi of sarnath because from sarnath we have found a buddha image and on the pedestal of this image there is this inscription and this inscription tells us that the present kshatrap uh, the present kshatrap became kshatrap when his father died and his father was also a kshatrap so the fact that you know uh, the the son of a kshatrap is also becoming a kshatrap means that the title of kshatrap uh, is hereditary and this would mean that uh, the ruler or the kushan emperor did not have you know much uh, much power to to change the kshatrap ruler or in normal circumstances it was uh, it was agreed that the son of a kshatrap would become uh, would become the next kshatrap so this suggests that there was some type of autonomous character then secondly what we see is that in the sarnath region especially uh, where this you know image was discovered close to this image there is this structure which is in the form of a stoop and this uh, structure was constructed to honor the dead kshatrap now according to some scholars the fact that you know the dead structure that this uh, this kshatrap was honored in sarnath means that this kshatrap also belonged from this region so i think it is quite logical to assume that suppose if this uh, kshatrap was from a different region so after his death the region from where he he came from it is in in that region we would, we would see the structure of uh, the dead the, to commemorate his memory but the fact that we are seeing it here according to some scholars suggest that uh, this uh, uh, this kshatra belong to the sarnath region and it also suggest that uh, the there was this autonomous uh, autonomy which the kshatrap enjoyed because uh, in order to rule a particular for example the sarnath region the kushan ruler had to had to you know make a kshatrap from the influential re, uh, influential people of 
द सारनाथ रीजन ओनली ही कुड नॉट यू नो ब्रॉट ए पर्सन फ्रॉम ए डिफरेंट रीजन एंड स्टेब्लिश हिम एज ए क्षत्रप इन द सारनाथ रीजन सो दिस इज यू नो आई थिंक दिस इज ए रफ रफ थ्योरी एंड देर इज आई थिंक वी कैन नॉट be sure of the fact that uh, this was that this particular kshetra belonged to the sarnath region especially but what is uh, what we can be sure of the fact that uh, kshetraps had great autonomy so this is quite you know uh, this is i think this is not a matter of debate but uh, what we can debate is whether this kshetra belonged to the sarnath region or varanasi region as a whole can be debated so so what we see is that kshatrapi is the uh, is the uh, region which is governed by a kshatrap now below kshatrapi there is this uh, territory called vishaya and below vishaya we have the you know lowest unit of government uh, governance which is called grama village so this is the broad structure of uh, uh, kushan state now uh, when we look at the you know uh, the number of offi- office officers that are found in the different kushan uh, inscriptions we uh, some scholars have argued that the number of uh, officers and the terms which are assigned to different officers and the task they were supposed to do is quite limited and the fact that you know the kind of area which was ruled by the kushan emperor was so vast and the fact that we have so little officers suggest that the uh, different entities or units of the empire uh, enjoyed a great level of autonomy now this is simple this is this is i think is not should not be debated because we have seen how you know in the akamenid empire the they had great autonomy of different kshatrapis and the, the kshatraps even issued their own coins but here that was not the case the kushan emperor issued their own coins but the kshatraps did enjoy great autonomy now another interesting fact is that uh, when uh, uh, about the kushanas especially and the kushanas king we see that uh, the kushanas from the start had uh, had uh, they tried to you know create a demi- uh, divine image of uh, of themselves and particularly their kings so what we see is that uh, the kushanas were famous for building uh, god houses which were called devakula or in uh, there, there is this also other term called boglango so devakula or boglango was a you know structure or a was a place where sculptures of dead kings were housed and these dead kings were worshiped so we are we know that we know about three devakulas which which have been discovered so first was in rabatak second was in surkotal so both both of these were in afghanistan and the third was situated in mat mat is ne- uh, in the out was is situated on the outskirts of uh, mathura city and from mat we have uh, we have found uh, uh, sculpture of vima cadphises of the famous you know kushan uh, king which i think most of us have seen this sculpture was from this uh, mat uh, this uh, this devakula of mat so uh, so this was one aspect where we see you know the kushanas have uh, have started to create a divine image of their kings and uh, another aspect of the kushanas is that when we look at their coins we see that the kushana ruler in these coins are depicted as semi divine beings so when we see the kushana king in depicted in these coins we de- we see that you know sometimes he have this halo over his head or nimbus as it is called so you know the, the light which which is shown uh, over the head area yeah, i think most of us are, are aware when we see uh, I- images of gods and goddesses there is this n- halo or nimbus around their head so this is you know present in the kushan coins as well uh, and particularly where the king is depicted 
and in some coins we have this image where this kushan king is emerging from clouds and in some some cases uh, flames are emerging from his arms so all of this suggest that there is this effort to divinize themselves so to say and uh, this main you know uh, this tendency of the kushanas to to call themselves dev putra and to build dev god houses or dev kula and you know portray themselves as semi divine beings on their coins all of this suggest that uh, there was you know the fact that uh, the kushan empire had territories which was autonomous and were ruled by governors who had who had uh, Uh, who had great autonomy so in order to you know uh, to say that we are above you or we are not you know uh, we are above you they started to portray themselves as semi divine beings so these governors were merely humans but the kushan king was a divine being so it was natural for him to rule over these governors although they had great autonomy but essentially they were still humans but the kushan king was a divine being and uh, the the fact that uh, his ancestors were worshiped in devakulas suggest that this this was the case so this is how kushanas argue now this pre- practice is quite similar to the roman practice because you know the romans were also known for worshiping their uh, worshiping their emperors and another important point which i think should be mentioned is that when we look at the kushan coins in the kushan coins we see that uh, there is depiction of iranian deities hindu deities like shiva uh, and, uh, and uh, other deities also appeared like skand etc so the the fact now uh, another important point which i think uh, should be mentioned is that about kanishk particularly the coins on which buddha is depicted particularly coins of kanishk is is quite rare i think only 0.1 or 3% had had depiction of buddha so you know uh, we have this misconception that kanishk was a great patron of buddhism this does not translate when we look at the evidence now this story of how you know uh, that kanishk was a great patron of buddhism this was uh, this became popular uh, this was uh, made popular by the chinese and what the chinese uh, basically it was the writings of huen sang and the later chinese uh, authors uh, and travelers who you know made kushan uh, kanishkas kanishk as a great patron of buddhism so they compared him to the to ashok so we should be rem- we should remember that when we look at kanishka's coin the amount of coin where uh, buddha is uh, represented is quite less so one thing we should keep this in mind so now coming back to this uh, 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 coming back to the Kani- uh, coins of kushan where we see you know different religion uh, are represented all of this suggest that uh, first first thing it, it is quite clear that uh, the the fact that you know kushan ruled this vast territory from central asia to some parts of china to uh, to indian subcontinent this suggest that the kushan uh, empire was linguistically socially religiously ethnically culturally very diverse so in order to incorporate or to have a sense of unity the kushan emperor tried to you know construct a level playing field or they did not want wanted to be seen as promoting a particular culture faith or religious tradition so that is why we see that you know they had they issued coins which have which which depicted uh, uh, buddhist uh, gautam buddha and also hindu gods and goddesses and also iranian god and goddesses and uh, this the and the you know their effort to call themselves deva putra and to be seen as semi divine beings suggest that they wanted to have uh, 
to be seen as supernatural beings and they were you know uh, they were born to rule so all of this attempt of the kushanas was to simply to amalgamate or to you know to form a cohesive unit that they could they that they can govern so that is why we see that you know incorporation of uh, different cultural titles that is happening and also this fact that there is this effort by the kushana kings to divinize themselves so i think this is the broad overview of how historians have tried to understand the kushana history but one thing we should be very clear is that there are still you know major uh, problems when we talk about the kushan state and most of these problems arise from the fact that we have very little evidence of the kushanas so it is quite possible that in future uh, with the with uh, with new evidence our understanding of the kushan state and how it was structured and how it was governed may change so i think we should keep this in mind also